Sorry, that's doggone hay fever kind of stuff you get out of there. It's asthma. Yeah. And it just, uh, I just cannot continue my work continuously. So I have to wait in between now. So getting older, I did it to myself by not wearing a mask. And so the Walter said it's payback. man told me once in, in uh, French Polynesia, I, I saw him from the back and I knew he was cradling his child and his body said so eloquently that he was a father and I was so attracted to his love for his son and as I approached him he just had a kind of loincloth. He turned to see me when when he got me getting closer, and his body was divided completely in half. The right side was tattooed from his hairline to his ankles, and then the other side was undecorated. 
so we talked about uh, tattooing, and he told me that his ancestors didn't need to speak the language of somebody whose island they were going to because they all had the same symbols. And when you got out on the beach, you just opened your body and the history of your people and what you meant in the world, was it was all clear. It was done silently. And so many people I've traveled with, traditional people, I really appreciate the fact that nobody says anything. And it, it teaches you that language collapses the world into meaning, and it's it's best left un uncollapsed. Un no, don't try to say what it is; just be in it. And that's you can't be afraid of silence. Silence is a gift, but my culture. Four seven, one way or another, billboards are always screaming at you. It's a, it's very hard to find a silent place and just appreciate somebody's company. You know, I, I remember the first time in some Indian villages. It was so lovely to see people like you and me sitting here like this. And you know, just watching the birds. We sat like that on your back porch once. Mm. You know, just watching the wind, watching the birds. You don't need to say anything. And it's way beyond anything you could, a person could say about what that bird is. Just watch the bird. And then we translate it, the three of us try to make, make it come alive and Time I traveled with. What's her name? Yeah, what's her name? No, no. <laughs> she made us all go. I didn't want to go. But before, I had to crawl under the porch and get a little bottle of dirt to take with me. Insulated in that army stuff, you know, but just to be yourself that way. So I had to take a little bit of home with me. So mm -hmm. when the thing came along, and they have a walupa, which is a big ball of tobacco, and a red cloud. And when you go to meet and somebody's Approach trouble or mystery rather in Christchurch. Then things were given to us that we'd been given in a completely different situation. So as I walked down the street, there were Maoris on both sides. So there's three of us abreast. And right in front of me, in the middle of Christchurch, is a, a bow of cedar laying on the street. <laughs> I, I couldn't, I had to stop because I, I couldn't step over it, you know, and see my feet. So I put down the medicine and, uh, and I picked it up and put it in my bag. And then, we became aware that we were going to have a ceremony with these crania that had been exchanged with uh, the, the government and, and, and archaeologists 
sort of what you call the paleontology, uh, at uh, New Zealand. And so then it was all prepared for what I needed to do a ceremony because it had been given to me before. I had things for a long time that I carried things with me. And then I find to diverse myself of those things because the way Maori John used to say was, you know, if you really love it, you move it on. Because every time it moves on, the mana, the power gets, mm. gets bigger. So even down to the finest thing of leaving just as Murphy did with the water of the medicine and the water used stent, there was a cedar tree, it was very like a teepee, very conical, very beautiful, and I just walked around that just like we did at the sweat house, and there was the door, there was a break in the thing where the kids had been going in and playing inside, so it's just like approaching a sweat, sweat house, first door, last door. I went inside there and I was able to put some food and medicine for them, say thank you and ask for you know, whatever we were united because of those crania put trip there and whatever we can do. And all that was taken care of. Didn't have to worry about it. Didn't have to fuss about it. <coughs> Dreams come to really annoying. Weird. I didn't at the point I would, one of those people would deny that I dreamed. I dreamed that there was, remains were all over Lillian's house, cranium. I remember one popped up out of the floor or the vent or something, you know. And then she said to her, she was holding it. And, uh, <coughs> and so we made a, we made a casket out of cedar and split it. Made the best we could make it that way. And the guy at the grocery store that does the mail stuff out of it. He was really curious about that box being there. <laughs> what are you doing with that? <laughs> Mail it to uh, Portland. <laughs> oh, pretty nice. Yeah. You don't want it. So you're always home when you need to be, whether you like it or not. And then. After that, it took about two years of spontaneous crying and dreams after that, greeting the cranium that way there in Christ Church. And, uh, They can get home, but I don't know if they did or not because they told me to shovel off. I'm done now. All I had to do was get that much there. Mm. So, uh, but a couple of years later, more I heard from a guy out in Oklahoma or someplace who was asking me about. to a committee that were trying to understand and make the laws work such that they could move, move the crania from one place to another place internationally. And so I mean, all I could do was tell them to get a hold of those guys. And, so I never heard again. But I, 
I'd like to move that around the corner, which uh, I think I wrote to Barry about that, that. At about the same time, a very period of time, somebody brought the ovum from my do country, I think, or no, um, wouldn't you? Anyway, they brought the ovum for the salmon, the first salmon to introduce to New Zealand. And we went down, and actually I got to see them uh, one of the times I was down around the west side, and got to see them in their barn. Some of them were really huge. But about the same time that they came up with the crania that came up with the ovum to start having salmon in New Zealand mm -hmm. at the same time. So maybe the same ten period ten year period of time at less. Seemed like it was less, but a couple of years anyway in So the fish moved dead and they were bringing the new life for the salmon. That's about all I know about that. They're still there. They're still going back. Yeah. They uh, still go to the rivers. Yeah. And uh, you know that uh, I was telling the Maori people that were there uh, my friends, I said, we're really related because of the salmon. Yeah, and um, and I said, you know, it, it's there's no denying it. And so then they suggested I get that tamoko to prove that we're united. Mm. And so, but I have a ha happy ending. I it's not a happy ending at all, but before the uh, found the skull, um, that, that um, my worker, her uncle and her mother would go out to the Columbia River and they, they were great diggers. And uh, she happened to say, uh, that um, there was a skull in the basement for 45 years that yeah. the uncle had. Wow. And I thought, oh, it just got me. And uh, and to think that that ancestor had never seen sunlight. And so I, uh, I said, that can't be, you, you've got to give it up. And uh, he can't have any of that stuff. And he can't have anything that he robbed our people from. And so I, um, she had no choice. I gave her no choice whatsoever. And so she brought it. And then I called my brother. And he says, you are the keeper of this. I thought, oh, I, I. I'm not worthy of this, you know. It, it, this is just too, too emotional. And um, then I did, and then of course, what you do is you call your friends. Bartle, the United Box. You know, and somebody else had some elk hide. Mm -hmm. Can I have some elk hide? Somebody else gave me a piece of tenelfin wool and cover it with. And um, so I had it for a couple of weeks and um, I had anxiety dreams or visions, I don't know what it was, every night and um, I was I was disturbed. I was glad it was found out of the basement 
but I was disturbed that this person could live with himself, you know, with having something that does not belong to him, belong to the earth. And, um, and so we got the archaeoanthropologist, and he said it was, it was a male, and it was over 400 years old, and um, he was from when um, Diane explained to me where they found it. He said it was just floating. You know, that's a big fat lie. And um, and I I couldn't call her on that. There were too many things going on. And uh, he just grabbed the skull, or the cranium, as you call it, and. Um, the anthropologist said he would take it off my hands and take it home. And then later, um, my brother called me and he says, I'm standing here on the river. There has to be somebody that stands, stays behind to hold the horses. So he's holding the horses while they took the boat out to the island and we buried the ancestor. Mm -hmm. And so, so that was the end of that. And uh, we'll never know which island it was, but all the, all the ceremonial islands are called memelus. Mm -hmm. That means the spirits, mm -hmm. spirits live here. And um, not the one by the rest stop, you know, but it's all the islands that were there. At least I know where it went. And then my dreams ceased, and, uh, and then I began seeing this person. And I went out and made a mask. I gave the skull a face, and it turned out so beautiful. And I was so pleased that he was such a handsome man. Mm -hmm. You know, and and that I felt like I was honoring him, and so then my dreams just quit. You know, I had completed it. I onagamified it, so I went down to the firing. You know, and I said I want to know where this is in the kiln, and I want to put wood on it. I want to be the one to to cover this one with ashes. And so it did. It took me a couple of years to talk about it, mm -hmm. and I still get emotional. Mm -hmm. And uh, like you, and so it, and, and like you, and so it just, it, it just these things that we end up having to do. You know, we, I could have said, give it to somebody else, but I, I took it, and I didn't know. I had the courage. so true that it's hard. That kind of courage. I don't need this. I still don't know if it was courage or just there was no one else to do it. He was calm. Teach it, 
teach a bunch of kids about where they come from. And they've never heard of Solana Falls. They've never known that we've been there for 12,000 years, if not longer. And uh, they are just so totally amazed. You know, and some of them were little Indian kids. And, uh, you know, that some things are too painful to know, you know, how how like a village like Silalo has fallen into a disconnect because of their grief and sorrow that um, I tried to help them and eventually had to give up because one of the mothers didn't like her, her daughter going away to college. I was going to help her go to college and she said, don't come anymore. I don't want your business. And, um, you know, that really hurt because those kids just really loved me. And I loved them back. And I was teaching them things that they needed to know. And, um, and the woman was so angry and filled with grief and sorrow and bitterness that it was, uh, when I got the letter, it was just so painful mm -hmm. that, um, so there were different kinds of, of pains that we go through that make us stronger. So I know I'm getting stronger, you know, and as we get older, our friends get sick, our friends, we have to care for them, pray for them, and, uh, all over, you know, we're getting sick. <laughs> so, you know, we have to let some of that stuff go and pray that somebody will go to the village and, and help this lady, you know. She needs somebody there much stronger than I to go and, and help her realize, you know, that um, the future we need each other, you know, we're a community. And um, she's isolated herself in the village. She and her, her family of friends. And it's just sad that I couldn't do it, but somebody has to go and do that. And so I, I'm hoping it soon because she's, um, the daughter is a senior now and has to start thinking of an education, of living outside the village, mm -hmm. finding her own way. Mm -hmm. So she can only hope for that stuff. Yeah. I'm trying to look back many years ago when the three of us met and I was so impressed with the work that you were doing and the lady was doing. And I was trying to understand my what is my place? What how do I how can I understand how to behave? Um, and I don't have in my culture a strong tradition of uh, social responsibility. And one of the things that I've learned over the years from both of you is that uh, one way or another the work is always about community. Um, ancestors move into you and compel, uh, as you say, you know, you felt compelled to give that man a face. And, and the way I think of it, he was saying, Lillian, help me. I need some, I need to be at peace. And we're in a hard time now, you know, global climate change, ocean acidification. And I'm very hopeful that people in my own culture will understand that many of us 
us have been sidetracked and we're thinking about ourselves and thinking that we're separate from those around us. When traditionally, you know, storytellers and traditional societies were always there only for the community. And your responsibility was to tell the story that would help. And you said just a while ago, Art heals. <clears throat> it heals us when we do the work, and it heals others who come in contact with it. But it's not an idea that surfaces very often. But now I think it has to. It, everything that artists, uh, including writers, do has got to be helping people what is coming, which will fill us all with grief, destabilize us. There's so much grief coming from what we've done to the earth. So I'm hopeful that in both of your traditions, um, that the doors will open and this life work that both of you have chosen will, will heal far far outside the world that is familiar with your work. It's always been tragic to me that indigenous art in North America is unknown to most of the people in North America. <laughs> How can you make a living here and not, and not be involved in the history of what humanity has been doing here long before my people got here? It's hard. It requires compassion, and not condemning people. I think, but just helping. We just gotta help. Just gotta help. We were we were invited to the flight. to show us was Georgia O'Keeffe. There was no native art to welcome us. Hmm. They had one painting of Georgia O'Keeffe. <laughs> what the hell is this? And that's all they have. It's the only thing that even comes close to the Indians is <laughs> Georgia O'Keeffe. But the best one, the best one was Charles and I were made, made to go to a, a huge, big dinner. And the guy that paid for the wing <laughs> called his wife his little squaw. Oh! Millionaire. He was going to give his, his little squaw a few minutes, so don't worry, he's not going to let her take too much time with this little squad. It was like, what was it, $40,000 a plate or something? Mm -hmm. Huge. <laughs> and the whole place you could have heard. And he didn't understand, he just kept rambling right along. Never Everyone said. gasped. Everybody else got to stand with their mouth of food just going, <laughs> did he really say that? Oh. We've always to travel. Mm. We're glad we're a traveler. We come, mm. and and uh, oh, darn the young young native artist. He had a temerity to make a painting of. Uh, crucified woman and Laura Bush was right on the news saying sent a letter to him to say that she would like to talk to him <laughs> so he didn't go to the show <laughs> he stayed home <laughs> to tell him in Long Bridge about that 
I saw something get turned inside out once in a way I really appreciated. Uh, it was a Navajo jeweler had made a pair of cufflinks with, um, uh, I guess with coral and lapis and mother of pearl. They were stylized American flags. Mm. But you knew as soon as you looked at the pattern that it was to be an American flag. And this man was, had a few people around him. He was just making his living as a jeweler. And in the, I think it was in the square in Santa Fe. And uh, somebody said, uh, why, why are you, uh, why would an Indian make a, American flag cufflinks, and the Navajo guy said to him, it's my country too. It was a great moment of just turning that situation inside <laughs> out. Yeah, right, to say it. I wish I had that kind of sense of time. Oh, yeah. Me too. <laughs> I don't, you know, I, most, most of the people that I've met in North America who served in, in Vietnam or you know, back Korea and World War II and Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, are, can be very articulate about why, the, why they went and feeling their country was threatened, the warrior tradition. Yeah. And it uh, doesn't have anything to do with politics and that kind of stuff. When you're threatened, you show up and defend your people. And I think that's a hard one for, for You know, people will say, well, Indian people have been treated so badly by the country, why would you, why would you go to Vietnam? Just missing completely um, a native way of looking at it. It's not, it's not tied up with all the political stuff. I wanted to ask both of you a question that has grown up in me over the years. Um, in, uh, in my tradition, uh, we've experienced over the past four or five hundred years <coughs> a kind of um, celebration of the self, the importance of the individual. price that has, we've had to pay for that is the disintegration of community. And, you know, I'm just a superficial observer, but it seemed to me in, in context, traditional context, in several places in the world, in, in addition to North America, there was a kind of genius that permitted individual expression, um, but uh, everybody understood the freedom to behave as an individual was, was sacred, but the community could not be harmed by whatever you were going to do. So. What I saw in traditional societies was a freedom to be an individual, but a kind of wisdom about never doing it in such a way that the community suffered. So what you had in the end was really strong communities and really individuated people. Um, nobody was a clone. Mm. You, you know, you followed, the kids always would fight against the traditional way of doing things and whatnot, that's in every culture. But when you watch the adults, you saw beautifully individuated people that had grace and composure and were um, fully formed. But the result of the individuation was a, a, a community that was strong as 
is something made out of steel. And so I can encounter situations where the community had been punished and beaten and degraded by a dominant culture, but not broken, never broken. And I would think, how can you, what is it that, that you see in these cultures that I don't have in my culture? There's a great individual expression, but um, I remember one time traveling up north and I asked the same series of questions in every Eskimo village I was in. And I would say, when you think of my culture, what do you, what's the first thing that comes to mind? And the answer almost always was lonely. You're a lonely people. Meaning you don't, you, you just, you figured out how to be an individual, but you don't seem to come from any kind of community. You always show up in the village alone. You don't have a family with you. You're just alone, and and as a result, a lonely people. I thought that was pretty perceptive. So the question I wanted to ask, if you had any insight, because <coughs> in dominant culture in North America, there's everyone is urged to stand out, to be interesting, to be an individual. Not much emphasis on maintaining the integrity of the community. And the people who are looked at in my culture as strong individuals are artists, who are devoted to uh, the development of an artistic vision. And both of you have you can, I can see a few brush strokes or, you know, the edge of a mask, and I know you made it, or I know you, you were working on that piece of paper or canvas. You know, you, very distinct work, two distinct bodies of work. So you, you're expressing yourselves as individuals, but you're you're both completely embedded in a sense of community, in a sense of community responsibility with that skull. And you know, you've done a lot of work with young people, helping them. And that, you know, you could have been in your studio painting, but you chose to take the time, or you know, sometimes with kids that got in trouble, and help them, help, help them come along. I really admired in both of you that you work so hard to bring the vision up out of yourselves that you never lose sight of the larger picture, which is how we take care of each other. Our ancestors. Our ancestors have always done the right thing, you know, for the community. Mm -hmm. And um, living on the reservation where we're all all the same, we're all poor. You know, we it, it was in the I was born in nineteen forty three and so it was tough times all the time I was growing up. But nobody starved because the whole neighborhood would would take you in as family. You know, if if one made it really well. They didn't just stand out and say, I have done it. Right. You know, and keep their their good fortune. They say, I've been lucky. I'm going to share. So we'll all share. We all go to the longhouse, have a giveaway, mm -hmm. and, and share all our goods when somebody dies. We have ceremonies, and everybody brings stuff to give away in, in memory of this person that's in the center of the room that eats with us and sleeps with us. And um, until the third day where we put this, this wonderful individual away and to be rejoined with Mother Earth. And so it's, it's that thought of what it is we are 
doing in that sense you lose your ego mm. and um, because you're not thinking of just yourself you're thinking of you know who can benefit from this you know and, and um, I really don't know because it, it's strange to me because we were so poor we were just so pitifully poor and um, you know and so were our neighbors so for entertainment I would go across the street and watch this little old lady uh, sit on the floor and do her bead work and I would just squat down and watch her bead in silence mm -hmm. you know that was our entertainment or I'd go up in the hills and lay there and, and on the ground and, and watch the flowers grow you know, or we'd go hunting with dad, and or we'd go huckleberry picking with mom. You know, we were always there for each other. There was, it was torture for my mother to have us kids around her all the time, <laughs> you know, because we never had babysitters. And so it, you know, we all, and then dad never planned, you know, when we were gonna go huckleberry picking. He never planned to bring a tent or a TV or anything. We just all had to sleep on the ground at night, you know. And uh, mom would sleep far away until this bear came running down, jumped over her. <laughs> and, then she, and then she sat up like, like uh, the guy in the gods must be crazy. Mm -hmm. Remember how quickly mm -hmm. he sat up? And so, and so. I don't know why I saw that, but I did. I saw my mother sit straight up. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, she didn't know whether to laugh or to, to, to be scared for her, you know. Or but, for her. And so, yeah. And uh, so then she came in back into the car to squeeze in with us kids. And so, you know, so there was fun times that, you know, so, and, and you're just so pleased you survived. And, um, and then you see your old ones go, and, and it's so sad. And, and I've lost all my friends I grew up with, every single one of them. And um, it gets kind of lonely. And then, so then I find a newer community, you know, a new, new artist friends, kindred spirits. You know, it doesn't matter what, what color they are, or what race, what ethnicity. They're, they're all loving people, and uh, I think that might be, that might be what it is. Mm. And when there's, there's an angry drunk that's so hard to cope with, then it's in the longhouse, which is very disrespectful, but he doesn't know that because he's drunk. He goes into the longhouse. He's not disruptive. And then, so my friend who was in the Vietnam War, he said, I said, just pointed. And uh, so he got up and he went carefully, went over and took, took the soldier on down. You know, didn't make a scene. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, um, he was my cousin Elmer's half-brother. And he was a Green Beret and just as gentle as could be with the soul drum. And so, you know, and that's that's what nobody else would do. And you know? taking care. Yeah. Taking care. I don't know if that answers you or not. Oh, it's not an answer, it's just, uh, you know, we're just watering the flowers here a little yeah, bit. You, know, yeah. you said something, Rick, about giving away it gets bigger, the power that's in it gets bigger. And you did a great favor once years ago for one of my daughters. We'd come to see you, and mm -hmm. she was an artist, and I um, wanted her to see um, how you worked. And we had a wonderful day together, and when we were leaving, we were in the house, and saw this beautiful hand and she expressed uh, enthusiasm and awe about that hand and you said to her, well, why don't you take it? And she, she couldn't believe that something like that, you would just give it away. And so she questioned you and she said something like, uh, oh my gosh, 
gosh, this is too important. I, I can't take this. Um, I, I can't, uh, you can't give this to me. And you said to her, why not? Somebody gave it to me. <laughs> <laughs> and that's that, that's that line uh, that, that, that recognizes that everything is in the river. E everything, everything is in the river moving. You can't own something, you know. You you're with it for a while, and you you're in you're in good relations with it for a while, and then the, the pleasure and the power and the continuity and the survival is all about li releasing it to the world, releasing it to whomever comes in directly and asks for it. But in in my tradition, <laughs> we don't have much of that, you know. It's all us holding on to things, and and uh, instead of saying give it away so it increases its power, its power to heal and to help, we say, on my side, we say, uh, oh, I'm going to hold on to that until it increases in value, and then I'm going to sell it. Yeah, well, that's a short road, and we're finding that one out. Yeah, that's the truth, you isn't know, it? You it, 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 time is running out. And uh, soon we'll all eventually just have to be Americans. And uh, we're all in the same boat. And I don't know if people are even thinking about that now. Well, the, 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 a, another set of elders has to emerge because the, the people who claim they are the elders are still their children. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not grown-ups. Mm -hmm. they, they're in it for, well, I shouldn't speak that way, I guess. No, but speak I, that way. I, you know, so many women and men I've met in traditional settings, they really know. They just know. They, they're the caretakers of what will work. You know, I, I think I said this when we were together the other night, that in, in, a, in a situation, a man like Orrin Lyons, if, if you took him and put him in 2015, or you put him in 1515, he would make the right decisions. I, d I don't think the elders are tied into time, or, or they're not distracted by technology. And they see right to the place where uh, this is good for us, this is really bad. And I, I heard a man say one time, young man, he said, uh, the funny thing about elders is that you bring a problem to them that is has made you sleepless. You're tearing yourself up inside with this problem and you bring it to the elders and you might hear, oh, that's nothing. Don't worry about that. Go have a nice meal somewhere. And he said, when you walk out, you think, well, you're, you're, you tend to think, well, he doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm in great pain, and my girlfriend doesn't like me anymore, or something like that, you know. Mm. But he said, what, what you realize is the history of this is whatever she tells you or whatever he tells you, you can believe it, and you, you're released from your pain. And he said, at the same time, in conversation with an elder, you might describe a situation that's kind of amusing to you and laugh it off, and the elder will say, that's very serious, it's not a laughing matter, you need to think about that. And you walk away thinking, oh, maybe I didn't understand it at all. I heard another man say once in the village up north that uh, there was a long public discussion in the church about social matter, and long discussion, three hours, everybody who had something to say said something, and there was a woman in the back of the church with a broken finger, I remember, and when everybody had finished saying what they thought should be done, she raised his hand with a broken finger and said, no, and that was it, and I realized that the people who had been most vocal arguing for something, 
didn't say, oh, she's just an old woman, she's wrong, what does she know? They walked out of that church thinking, what did I miss? <laughs> what did she see that I missed? Because she just saved my life again. And that, that's, that community thing, we, I think in my culture we found the elders inconvenient because they, they advised against the, the road that we're on now. You really helped me with giving me the book um, Reverence. Mm. You know, that was so helpful. And I started sharing it. And um, it's Reverence the Forgotten Virtue. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I thought, oh, one thing this doesn't have. It doesn't have the Native American person. Yeah. You know. We've, we've been around just as long as, as Plato and, and Aristotle, you know, when you think about it. Right. You know, the indigenous people have been here, and I missed their voice. And, uh, but I gave the book, I, I kept ordering and reordering, because nobody gave me the book back. And, <laughs> <laughs> Good. and so they, they uh, they just found it so appropriate, and it changed their lives. And uh, and then those that didn't care haven't read it yet, you know. So you can tell Lizzie hasn't read it. Really. And uh, uh, and I think sometimes there's an arrogance that that lets us think we know it all. Mm. And uh, so we don't need any more information. It's just what I'm writing is important, and, mm. and or just what I'm doing is important. I don't need to know anything else. And so that I don't know how to fix that. You know, to, to have a person open up to more indigenous knowledge, as you say, that yeah. you've been trying to express. And, and uh, and Rick, you're always saying it, and I just love you guys for it. You know, you're so authentic, and and it, it's an authenticity that is so important. And I just wish you could duplicate and replicate yourselves because the kids aren't getting it. The younger generation aren't getting it. I have talked to this one young man who's tall, handsome, has beautiful grades, and I talked to him as straight as I could so he would understand it. And um, I said, "You have arrested development," mm -hmm. and uh, and so and that's what it was. He's he's older. And he's still doing graffiti, you know. And uh, and I said, why do you do that? You're destroying other people's property. And he says, that's my art. I says, there's lots of paper. You can buy paper. I'll give you some paper. And you know, it, you don't need to destroy something to create beauty, you know. And. Um, He's never going to get it. You just know where a person reaches a certain point that it's not going to sink in because he's never had a tough time. He's never had to struggle because he got all these women hovering over him, mm -hmm. taking care of him. He's got two daughters and um, He'll take all his family to all these these business functions and and he, no sense of appropriateness and um, and I think is this another time to give up? 
you know, and move on and find somebody more receptive? Yeah. Or do I just hang in and beat myself against you, the wall? You, 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 I, I think, you know, it's, I mean, I'm being presumptuous about your situation, but um, uh, these, the, the kids that uh, are um, disrespectful in, in the large sense, they just haven't met the right teacher. And the great teacher is waiting in the wings, and that's the earth. Um, I've, I've so often thought the only person that can teach you how to behave is what's outside those windows there. And if you, if you understand that, um, that, you know, it's you do everything you can, Rick does everything he can, but some of them, you can't be the teacher for everybody. There's some that, that can't hear it, and they need to meet another teacher. And what that means is that we should all be aware of the responsibility of trying to carry something that is moving through us and give it away, and if it doesn't connect, it doesn't connect, and we move on. You, know, you can't beat yourself up because somebody can't hear it. Some, some people are waiting for songs that nobody can sing. And, th and that's why I think the community of artists, it's good for us mm -hmm. to be together because our songs are different and we, we, we share certain, uh, uh, we, have, we have a similar reverence for what is not human. We're always thinking of ourselves in terms of relations all the components of the earth, and so we share that. But we're but our songs are different, and you know I I think uh, somebody who appreciates what you do or what Rick does, you know, would read a story of mine and think I don't get this. You know, I don't even finish the story. Well, that's okay. <laughs> you know, yeah. that, that that's fine. But uh, the beautiful thing to me about the circle of artists that, that I feel in, and you know, the other people I talk to, uh, the ones I've chosen, I guess, to be close to are those who are not in it for themselves. They're in it for something else, and it's hard to describe what it is. Well, you're getting older and I'm feeling compassion for your age. <laughs> <laughs> We're all feeling that way now. <laughs> I like when you said that. You know, we're counting up all of the ills of our friends who are passing away and uh, we have a few ourselves. <laughs> But that's okay. No. Yeah, it is. You'll get, you know, there'll there'll be others that'll come along. You know, we've always we've always believed that. You know, we're it's like there are these fires. You know, on a day like today, the wind is really blowing, rain all over the place. You know, if you were out there trying to keep a fire going, that's what we're doing. You know, and when we fall down, there'll be somebody there who will keep the fire going. And then one day the weather will clear. <laughs> I hope, you know, and then people will sit around the fire and be warm and not soaking wet, you know. Yeah, but yeah, it's because yeah. in your time you keep that little fire going and people, people will laugh when you're out there in the rain and trying to keep the fire going, but that's what life is. Yeah. No one said it was fair. They did, they were lying to themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, history.
country is full of cultures that really learned that lesson yeah. <laughs> that life is not not fair, you know, that it got run over by, by other people. You know, where do we go from here? Yeah. You don't have a choice. No, I don't never was a choice or a no. plan or map when we got it. Yeah. And it looks pretty the same way it is when we got it now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a lot of good work in the world, you know. I, I told, I, I think I told the story the other night that I, you know, one time I, I knew that if I stayed in my own world, that I would become the creation of my own ideas. And I didn't think that was good, you know. So I was always trying. I've always tried to. lives completely ruined, crushed, and museums torn apart by the Taliban, and really alarming the life of being stopped by police and inspected and car torn apart every 10 minutes or something. And then from there I went to northern Sumatra after the tsunami, and 230,000 people died there in about 10 minutes. And I, I remember one night I, I got uh, six, six men at a table and a translator and myself, and I asked each person to tell the story of what happened that day for them. They'd all lost their families. And when I say lost their families, mm -hmm. a wife, mother, a father, all of their children, all of their brothers and sisters, every, every, lost everything. They forget the house. And what I heard around the table that night at dinner was uh, down the road. They just, they were going to go down the road. And when I got on the plane to come home in Jakarta, I called Deborah and said, I have more hope for humanity now than I did when I got off the plane in Beirut, although I've seen nothing but disaster. And the reason for it is this remarkable quality in human beings to, to bend but not break, and for egoless people to organize, help, help and organize other people. They're not self-promoters, they're not in business, they're not in government. They're just, they're warriors. They're men and women who are, are they know what to do in a disaster situation and other people defer to them quickly because they say, she knows. Whatever she says to do, then we're doing that. And there's no nobody saying, oh, well, my opinion would be, <laughs> you know, the, the, and those, so in each of those different cultures, and they're all radically different, they, they understood that this group of people that are called the elders in, in many societies, you they're the only glue that's holding the thing together when the bomb goes off. And when you see that in these different cultural contexts, I could say, we, we, we know how to do this, even when it's really bad. I mean, look at how many traditions, how many native traditions in North America are still here. 
if you approach it with a rational mind, you'd say, well, no, that's not possible because there's too much, there are too many efforts to kill people and destroy their language and take everything and burn it. All that happened, but Indian people are still here, mm -hmm. and elders are still here, and these traditions are still here. Infinite patience, infinite patience with destructive societies. Mm -hmm. The same with animals, you know, I think so often at my home, I think, what group of beings have been more patient than animals with us, giving us everything for tens of thousands of years while we tear up their homes, burn down the places where they live, kill them just for, as they say, sport. You know? And still they're, they're there for us, you know. But many, many human traditions have, have in ceremony, express again and again the, the road that takes you to the non-human world and how the gift that you get there makes you come to life as a human being in a true way, in an authentic way. So even though it gets bad, you, don't you feel hopeful sometimes? Yeah, because you feel yeah, like resilience. Yeah, resilience. You know, that's what those little guys were always saying, there's a little crack in the door where people feel we're going to make through. Mm. I, I can't live without a crack in the door. Mm. You know, I just uh, used to always argue with Walter about that when we were at the Sword House around. Yeah, and, and I'd say I couldn't, I just couldn't stand it to think of my daughter floating face down in the river, or their, their kids, you know, and I cleave to the ones where they say there's, there's always going to be a little crack in the door so that yeah. somebody got to scoop through there. Yeah. I can't live without that. But Down, I'm just thinking of two things, and one about the wing. The wing is a kid. It's a kid wing. It's a kid. I was able in my life, in a night about like this, to sing with a young coyote in the back back lawn there in South Beach. Yeah. Young, young kid. We sang together. And in the same stretch there, I sang one afternoon, broad daylight, sat on, on the street and sang with a, a kid eagle. Landed up on a telephone. So it's going back the other way where the, where also coming together with the young other species. Yes. Means we can't lose our voice. Yeah. They're still coming ashore. Hmm. <laughs> <coughs> I'm done. Hey. Hmm. I'm so glad. This has been a blessing to me. Thank you.
Oh.